I want to encourage you to get a bulletin before you leave at the close of services this morning. A uh, number of items that I want to highlight. Uh, pay careful attention to the main article. Uh, it will give you some indication as to what we're doing in terms of security as a congregation so that you can assemble with a reasonable degree of confidence that uh, this is a safe and secure place to worship God. I also want to remind you that Adam will be making his fourth or fifth trip to Haiti uh, in relationship to Hope for Haiti's Children. And uh, he covers all of his expenses himself, so uh, he's not asking for any assistance uh, for himself. But we like to help with that program, and uh, this year again we're going to try to provide a light breakfast and a lunch of beans and rice for the children that uh, he will be seeing in the course of the week that he'll be there. As I mentioned last year, the main complaint of every child is my belly hurts, but their bellies hurt because their bellies are empty and if we can do something in a small way to help with that problem, we're more than happy to do it. If you can contribute, just write your check and note in the memo that it's for Haiti uh, children and we'll see that it gets there and if it's not something that you want to do or feel compelled to do, that's not a problem. This is just an opportunity for some of us who would like to be a little more involved in that work to do so in a financial way. Trust me, they don't want me coming to Haiti to take care of children, but I can send a little money that will help fill their bellies and that's always a good thing when it comes to youngsters. I do want to remind you, and I will remind you again next Sunday, God willing, that the 24th, we will meet at 9 and 10 at our regular times and then break for lunch and reassemble at 1 for an afternoon service. There will be no 6.30 service on the 24th. Now please note that the times of our services are not determined in Scripture. And there's certainly nothing unscriptural about making this alteration on that one Lord's Day. In fact, it should be very beneficial, especially for families and children, and we want to make it as convenient and as easy as possible for us to be able to assemble on the Lord's Day as we customarily do and worship God in spirit and in truth, and yet free those of you who have family obligations to meet those obligations and uh, not have to make the hard choices of do I disappoint family or do I come to worship because you can do both without any difficulty at all. So plan your schedule accordingly on the 24th. Now we're going to turn our attention to today's study. Our focus on the passage that Kurt read a moment ago from Philippians chapter 1 deals primarily with our conduct as children of God. We who are Christians are called to act in a certain way because of our relationship with the Master. And if we follow this passage as I think it should be outlined, there are three principles that need to be underscored in relationship to what Paul is writing to the church. I want you to know that I come to this setting from the perspective that everything that we do ought to be done with a desire to please God. More than anything else in the world, I want to live my life so that I'm pleasing in His sight. My calling in life is not to please my mate primarily, my family primarily, or even you. It is always to keep centered in Christ, focused on God, and live life in a manner that is pleasing to my maker. And I must confess to you, that is a real challenge. It is a challenge to live life as Paul expresses it here, having a conversation or conduct that is according to the gospel. When we face any kind of dilemma, when we're called upon to bear any burden, 
when we find any obstacle in our path, our first recourse ought always to be to turn to God's Word for direction and insight in how to deal with that situation. I say that because of the language that is used here. Paul is talking about Christians as being a unique and distinct people in this world because our citizenship is not in this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. And because of our special relationship with God through Jesus as his children, we ought to act like children of God are called to act in every setting of life. So what does that mean? I will suggest to you first and foremost, it means that we are every day to be salt and light in a world that desperately needs both. If our conduct is that which becometh the gospel of Christ, then that analogy that Jesus made in chapter 5 of Matthew's gospel from verse 13 through verse 16 becomes the core of our very existence. We want to be salt so that we are pure in an impure world. We want to be salt so that we can exert a certain antiseptic quality on the people around us, pointing them heavenward and leading them to Christ. And we want to be salt so that we actually are making an impact that makes life better for those around us. Just like salt makes food taste better, Christian conduct enhances life, makes the world a better place. I say that because in this epistle which calls Christians to live a life that, becometh, that becomes the gospel of Christ, this is the most joy-filled letter of Paul's ministry. Over and over again, he talks about the joy and the rejoicing that comes through Jesus Christ. He closes by urging his readers, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. We have to ask ourselves, is that the way people perceive us to be? Are we joyous folk? Is this a joyous church? Do I live a joyous life in Christ? The reality is that everything that matters in life, I have in a relationship with him. So there is great cause for joy. As a Christian, our sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb. As a Christian, we have a direct line to the Father. We can approach him in prayer at any time with the confidence that he hears and he answers. As a Christian... We know that all things work together for good. That God's providence is at work in our lives. And when we go through the darkest, the most disappointing, the most disheartened times of life, God is still there and will bring us out on the other side better people. And I admit to you that in the midst of it, in the throes of it, it may seem impossible. But we're Christians and we're walking According to the gospel, our citizenship is in heaven. And even in the throes of despair, we can have a peace that passes understanding and a joy that is inexplicable. But we must live life according to the gospel, to be the salt that makes life better for all around us and points them heavenward. That's how the conduct of our calling reflects our relationship with Jesus to those who are nearest and dearest to us. It means additionally that if the conduct of our calling is according to the gospel that we strive every day to follow the example of our King. I know we have quoted from 1 Peter chapter 2 many, many times, too numerous to count. He left us an example that we should follow in his steps. But how well do we do that? Do you ask yourself before you react on occasion, what would Jesus do? 
How would he respond? What would he say? That's imperative if the conduct of our calling is to be according to the gospel. I can't think of a situation that we will encounter today that there's not a parallel in the ministry of our Lord. Yes, I know that people will say unkind things about us, but must we respond in kind? Jesus did not. I know that people will do unkind things to us. Must we respond with unkind acts as well? Jesus did not. I know that sometimes things will happen that we will find objectionable. But does that give us the right to respond in ways that are contradictory to the life and teachings of our Lord? Of course not. We are to look to Jesus as the pattern. And if the conduct of our calling is what it ought to be, we will be asking repeatedly throughout the day, what would Jesus do and respond accordingly? And I know someone is thinking, well, how do we know what Jesus would do? I dare say that there is hardly a situation in life that you will encounter that you will have difficulty knowing what Jesus would do or say and thus how you would respond. Our problem is not that we don't know, it's that we don't like what we do know. And our nature is such that we don't always want to respond to things as Jesus did and walk in his steps and follow his example. That doesn't negate the fact that that should be our goal every day. If the conduct of our calling is what it ought to be, we'll be salt and light in a world that desperately cries for both. We'll live our lives so that we walk in the steps of Jesus, that we follow his example. And therefore, as a result, we will become new men and women in Christ. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I want you for a moment, if you can, to think about your initial response to Jesus, your conversion, your immersion, and your resurrection from a watery grave to walk in newness of life. Are you the same person today that you were when you gave your heart and soul and life to Jesus in obedience to the gospel? And if you answer that you are, something is terribly, terribly amiss. Because we come into God's family as babies, born anew of the word into the family. Babies don't stay babies forever. If they do, something is terribly wrong. Neither should Christians. We should grow and develop and become the men and women that God calls us to be. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul likened that to putting off the old man with his corrupt deeds and putting on the new man, which is renewed according to knowledge. It's a lot like taking off dirty, soiled, tattered, and torn clothing and being reclothed in brand new garments. That's what we're seeking to accomplish when our life becomes the gospel of Jesus Christ and is reflected in our conduct every day. To what degree have you become a new person in Jesus? And where do you need to make improvement? These are questions that all of us can honestly answer for ourselves and seldom do, but can answer for everybody else and have no control over them. I'm not asking you today what your mate needs to do or what your neighbor needs to do, I'm asking you, what, what do we individually need to do to become the new creature in Christ that God calls us to be so that our lives truly are governed by the gospel? And when that happens, we'll be able to say with Paul in Galatians chapter 2, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I submit to you that that is the idea of living up to the conduct of our calling. It will require us then in a world that is filled with falsehood and dishonesty to be honest and truthful 
men and women living lives of integrity in a world where integrity is in short supply. And when we do, we'll become a moving force in our community and in our families, pointing others heavenward. And there's not one of us in this assembly that can't improve on the conduct of our calling. But this passage not only talks about having a life that becomes the gospel of Jesus Christ, it also talks about the consistency of our commitment that whether present or absent, Paul said, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And it's a crucial point as well. Not only must our conduct be upright and governed by God's word, that conduct must be consistent. Our commitment must be such that we carry it with us wherever we go, with whomever we associate. And that not, is not always the case as well. We, in essence, are called to resist culture. Our, our culture is in decline. I don't think any of you would disagree with that. We have faced the kinds of things over the last few decades as a culture that I'd never contemplated as a young man planning to preach. It just did not seem realistic to me that I would live to see a time when society would have such little value or see such little value in life. Where abortion on demand is the law of the land. And now euthanasia is a practice in more than one state. And may, if present trends continue, envelop the nation as well. And if you don't understand the, the term, euthanasia means mercy death or good death. It's the idea that you can eventually grow so old and so feeble that it's simply not financially feasible to keep you going. And so the loving thing is to dispatch you. Well, how do we get to that kind of environment? It's really quite simple. When you can't or don't value the life of the unborn, those who don't value the life of the unborn are not going to value the life of the elderly either. They're not going to see the sanctity of life, the preciousness of every unique, distinct individual. And that's our culture today. But we are running counterculture to that. We still uphold the sanctity of life. We still adhere to the principles of God's word as it relates to moral matters and human sexuality. We still believe that our words say more about us than merely the sounds that come out. That our words are a reflection of our hearts and bad words are indicative of a bad heart and good words are indicative of a good heart. And we use the same language and we dress in the same way and we conduct ourselves in the same manner wherever we are with whomever we associate so that we live consistently for Jesus. And yet I know from personal experience that this isn't always the case. Some of the most disappointing times in my life have come when I've seen people that I admired and respected and held up to be examples of true New Testament Christianity out of an environment other than this who were anything but what I thought they were. We call that hypocrisy, by the way. And the harshest words Jesus spoke were addressed to hypocrites in Matthew chapter 23. The reality is very simple. Paul said our conduct must be governed by God's word and that must be true everywhere with everyone. The best example I can cite is our speech. There are words that you would never expect to hear uttered from this pulpit or in a Bible class setting because they are so incompatible with our Christian profession. And yet people who would never use those words in a setting like this allow them to spew forth at work, 
and in the home and in their community without a second thought. That's the thing that Paul said should not happen. He said, our commitment should be such that it doesn't matter whether I'm with you or not. It doesn't matter whose presence you may be in. You are a child of God, and you will conduct yourself as a child of God ought to conduct himself or herself. That's the consistency of our commitment, which this passage demands. It's seen or reflected in our dress, in our language, in sexual practices. It's seen in the sanctity of life and in so many other ways. We're to stand fast, Paul says. Our commitment, our resolve is to be such that we are unbending. It is so easy to compromise and surrender to the demands of God. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy, or rather 2 Timothy, no, 1 Timothy 1, 19, 20, spoke of Hymenaeus and Alexander. Do you know those names? They were Christians, but their faith had been made shipwrecked. They didn't live lives according to the gospel. They were not consistent in their commitment, and thus their faith was destroyed. Their lives were a mess, and they lived without hope. In Galatians 5, 1 through 4, Paul warned of those who had fallen from grace and urged, Stand fast, be ye not fallen from grace. Because it is so easy for us to compromise and surrender and walk away from the Lord of life and fail to be consistent in our commitment, thus losing our soul eternally. I think that happened to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2 verse 4. Jesus said of them they had left their first love. They'd lost their commitment. They'd abandoned the master and it was reflected in their lives in their actions the scriptures tell us very plainly Matthew 10 verse 22 he that endureth unto the end the same shall be saved I made up my mind at 16 when I obeyed the gospel that no one and nothing was going to get between me and my eternal salvation my relationship with the Lord was the most important relationship I had and I had no intentions of allowing anything to sever that. I have to admit there have been times when it's been tested but never to the degree that our Lord was tested and he stood tall and strong and I know the promise of scripture we will never face any test so great that we cannot overcome it for with every test trial or temptation God provides a way of escape therefore Paul said to the church at Corinth be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord make sure that the conduct of your calling is that which the gospel demands and that the consistency of your commitment is such that wherever you go, whenever anyone sees you, they know that you belong to Jesus. And don't let anything or anyone destroy your relationship with him. And then the text says, demonstrate the courage of your conviction. Notice the passage once more. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. And how do you approach this suffering which is inevitable? With confidence, with conviction, with certainty, certainly not with fear the Bible calls us as people of God to be fearless before the enemy in fact to the young preacher Timothy Paul wrote he has not given us God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and love and a sound mind 1 Timothy 1 7 and in the Hebrews epistle in chapter 13 the writer says that he hath promised I will never leave you nor forsake you 
so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man may do unto me. In fact, if you look carefully at the teaching of Jesus, our Lord said there's only one thing to fear. It's not man. It's not Satan. It's God. Because it's God who can cast the soul into torment. And that word fear there is used in two ways. It's used in the common manner in which we associate the word today with, with anxiety and dread and anxiousness. But it's also used in terms of respect and love and loyalty. We ought to respect and love and be loyal to God because the consequences very simply are just we don't want to contemplate them. To be cast into the lake of fire and torment. The second death. The place of fire and brimstone. How easy we can compromise our faith. How easy we can lose sight of the demands of the gospel. Join in with the world and think all is well only to be awakened in judgment to the reality that our bad choices here result in God honoring those choices by casting us into eternal fire. We must be courageous in the midst of adversity. One of the remarkable things about the ministry of Jesus is his complete frankness and honesty. We spend time on the Beatitudes every so often because they're so powerful. His formula for the joyous life that Paul writes about in Philippians chapter 4. But you notice the last Beatitude? It's all about suffering and persecution. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. Life can be hard. Life is hard at times. But we are courageous. We stand tall. We're confident in Christ. When you look at the language of the New Testament in particular, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us, Romans 8, verse 37. Thanks be to God that giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord who causes us always to triumph in Christ Jesus because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We ought to walk out of this place the happiest, the most confident, the most courageous people on the planet because we are children of the King. Because heaven is our future. Because he loved us and died for us. But let me remind you again, our lives must be lived uprightly. Not perfectly, but uprightly. The conduct of our calling must be according to the gospel. The commitment that we make must be consistent. And the courage of our conviction must be evident. We live that kind of courageous, confident, convicted life. And the world is going to look at us and want what we have. We don't compromise. We stand for what is true and right. But we do it in a kind, loving, and humble manner. That puts the spotlight on the master. And calls men to follow in his steps. That's the challenge that I leave you with this morning as we leave this place and head to the restaurant or home to make sure that you live the life that becomes the gospel of Christ, that your commitment is consistent and your conviction is courageous. And I'll tell you, frankly, you can't do that one hour a week in assemblies like this. You need to be faithful in your worship. 
You need to be faithful in your prayer life, faithful in your study of God's Word. You need to come to every day with a desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior and to live your life so that He lives and acts through you, so that your citizenship is truly in heaven and the people around you see it every day. That's what Philippians chapter 1 is all about. And to the extent we embrace it and act upon it, to that extent we will succeed or fail in the Christian endeavor. How you doing? Do you need to do better? Don't we all? So let's try harder, live more faithfully, and know that heaven's in our future. If you don't share that hope, we don't want to leave this assembly without giving you the opportunity to confess your faith. And to be born anew of water and spirit into God's family. We will sing a song of encouragement. We'll stand here at the aisles. And if you'll come, we'll take your confession. And in short order, immerse you for the remission of your sins. So that you can rise to walk in newness of life. Living by the principles of this wonderful book. As they're spelled out in Philippians 1 and so many other places. If you're subject to his call, won't you come? Let's together we stand and sing. song will be number 288. 